Hi everyone, welcome back to more of our coverage of the respiratory system. Today we are going to be looking at some uh, physics properties of gases and how gases move from one location in the body to another and this will kind of lay the foundation for what we're doing also in our next lecture. So let's as always begin with our not really attendance questions. What is the pulmonary circuit? What is the systemic circuit? What waste product is produced during cellular respiration? And what is external respiration? So go ahead and try to answer those questions. Hopefully you've done that. So let's go ahead and see what the correct answers are. So what is the pulmonary circuit and what is the systemic circuit? We covered these back in uh, cardiovascular, so hopefully this is still pretty fresh. So pulmonary circuit is the pathway that blood follows as it leaves the right side of the heart, travels to the lungs, and then back towards the left side of the heart. And the systemic circuit is the path of blood as it leaves the left side of the heart, goes to all the different tissues of the body, and then comes back to the right side of the heart. We will be talking about both of those circuits today. Next, what waste is produced during cellular respiration? So this takes us way back to Bio 137 when we talked about cellular respiration right after the cell. So... During cellular respiration, remember that's the, uh, the process that takes glucose and oxygen and in the mitochondria it converts those uh, to eventually make ATP. And waste products, well one is water, but that kind of can get recycled in your body. So even though it is a waste byproduct, we don't really think of it as waste. The other is carbon dioxide. So cellular respiration is the reason that we breathe oxygen and the reason that we exhale carbon dioxide. And lastly, what is external respiration? This came from our first lecture of this chapter. External respiration was the exchange of gases inside the lungs, so between the lungs and the blood. So today we're going to be looking at all of these things and uh, kind of tying them into respiration itself. So first, let's talk a little bit more physics. And again, the physics that we're gonna be talking about in this chapter, they're not very deep, it's not very extensive. It's just important to understand the basic physics before we can learn the concepts that come after. So some basic properties of gases. We're gonna be talking quite a bit today and our next lecture or two about something called partial pressure. Now, partial pressure is a concept that says, let's say I have a liquid that's got several different gases dissolved in it or I have a collection of some kind of gas, such as the air outside. It's got several different gases in it. Well, there's gonna be different levels of each of those gases, say different percentages of those gases. And those gases each have their own little bit of pressure that contributes to the pressure of that gas. What do I mean by that? Well, remember when we were talking about movement in and out of the lungs, we said that atmospheric pressure was 760 mmHg at sea level. Well, that's the pressure of the atmosphere as a whole. But the atmosphere, even though you can't just look at it and tell, there's a lot of different components to that air. There's things like nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and water vapor and several others, but those are the big four. Well, each one of those contributes 
to that 760 mmHg. How much? Well, each one, we would say, has its own partial pressure. We'll see some numbers on our next slide, but let's look a little bit more at how do we get that partial pressure. We're going to look at something called Dalton's Law. Sometimes it's called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. So Dalton's Law says that in a mixture of gases, for example, the atmosphere, in a mixture of gases, the sum of the partial pressures of all of the components is equal to the pressure of the mixture. That can be a little bit tricky to understand, so I'm going to advance one slide, but we'll come back to this in just a moment. So here is the atmosphere at sea level. Remember the atmospheric pressure at sea level was 760 mmHg. So if we look at the four component gases, and remember, like I said, there are others, but they are all contributing so little, we can just basically ignore them. Nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Those are the four primary component gases of our atmosphere. And if we were to look, if we were to remove all of the oxygen and all of the carbon dioxide and all of the water vapor from our atmosphere to where we only had nitrogen. Well, nitrogen has a pressure of 597 mmHg. If we did the same thing, except we left only oxygen, oxygen has a pressure of 159 mmHg. Carbon dioxide has 0 0.3 mmHg, and water vapor has 3.7 mmHg. But, since we have all of them, each of them contributes a little bit. Nitrogen contributes its 597, oxygen contributes its 159, carbon dioxide and water contribute theirs. If we add all of these pressures together, we get 760 mmHg. So, what that means is atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 mmHg. It is comprised of a mixture of gases, and each one of those gases contributes to it. The contribution of nitrogen, we said, was 597. Another way to say that is the partial pressure of nitrogen at sea level is 597 mmHg. What that means is, at sea level, we know that there are lots of gases, but if we only consider nitrogen, it has a partial pressure, that's what that means, of 597 mmHg. At sea level, oxygen has a partial pressure of 159 mmHg. That means we know there are other gases there, but if we only want to talk about the pressure that oxygen provides, we call it a partial pressure because it is a part that is contributing to the whole of 760. So let's go back to our previous slide. The sum of the partial pressures of the component gases is equal to the pressure of the whole. If we add 597, 159, 0 0.3, and 3.7, the four partial pressures, we get 760, which is the pressure of the whole. Now, at higher altitude, remember we said if you go up in higher altitude, so if you were to climb a mountain, well, there's less atmosphere there pressing down against you. So at higher altitude, we said there was lower atmospheric pressure. Well, if there's lower hole pressure, lower atmospheric pressure, then each one of those 
contributing gases will have a lower pressure. That's why there is less oxygen as you climb a mountain. You see people climbing Mount Everest, they have those oxygen masks on. That's because they're so high up in the atmosphere, there's very little partial pressure of oxygen. Now the last thing that Dalton's Law says, the percent of a gas's contribution times total pressure is equal to the partial pressure of that specific gas. What do we mean by that? Okay, over here is the approximate percentage of gas at sea level in our atmosphere. Nitrogen is by far the highest percentage of gas that makes up our atmosphere. It makes up 98.6%, I'm sorry, 78.6% of our atmosphere. 78.6% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. Well, if you take 78.6% times 760 mmHg, which is atmospheric pressure at sea level, you get 597 mmHg. That's the partial pressure of nitrogen. If you take 20.9% of 760, you get 159. That's the partial pressure of oxygen at sea level in our atmosphere. So that's what these numbers mean. The percentage, what percent of our atmosphere does this gas make up, and the partial pressure. So Dalton's Law says these three things. No, you are not expected to remember the percentage of each of these gases or the partial pressure of each of these gases. What you do need to know, you need to know that 760 mmHg is atmospheric pressure at sea level. You do need to know that number. And you do need to know in order there's more nitrogen than anything else in our atmosphere, followed by oxygen, followed by water vapor, followed by CO2. You do need to know them in order. You do not need to know specific numbers except for 760 mmHg is atmospheric pressure at sea level. So let's talk about a disorder. Oxygen toxicity. So if you had me for Bio 137, you've heard me say this before, but it's good to repeat even for those who did have me and for those who didn't, you may or may not have heard of this. Oxygen is not good. There is only one single reaction in our body that we breathe oxygen for. Everything else, our body, and all living things go to great lengths to make sure that oxygen is not there. If it's bound to something, that's different. Oxygen is found in our DNA and in the food that we eat, things like that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about loose oxygen or oxygen that's not bound to anything. If we breathe oxygen... There must be a reason for it, obviously, and there is. Remember, in cellular respiration, oxygen is what pulled electrons out of the electron transport chain. But other than that one reaction, oxygen can be fatal. That's because it likes to pull electrons towards itself. And when that happens, it creates something called free radicals, which are loose, unpaired electrons. So oxygen really is not good. But, for the most part, that's only really a problem if you get to pressures that are greater than 2 atm. That means 760 is 1 atm. If you double that 760, now you're at 2 atm. So, 2 atmospheric pressures or higher. Most of the time, that's not going to happen.
But if there is, for whatever reason, too much oxygen, first thing that happens is you're going to start to feel pretty good. Um, lots of oxygen in your blood gives you kind of a high, but it will kill you. So oxygen toxicity is what we call that. So now let's move on and start talking about movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide from one part of your body to another. And I do not mean traveling around your body in blood. I mean crossing membranes. So external respiration. We said that was the movement of gases between the lungs and the blood. Specifically, external respiration is when we move oxygen from our lungs into the blood and we move carbon dioxide from our blood into the lungs. Now, when this gas is moving, when oxygen is moving from our uh, alveoli in our lungs into the blood, a certain amount of it moves. And when carbon dioxide moves from our blood into our lungs, a certain amount of it moves. But when we see this, and right now, this statement isn't going to mean much to you. So don't worry if this sounds really confusing when I say it. We will come back to it. Oxygen, when it moves, it has a steeper partial pressure gradient. Remember gradients? Remember when we were talking about diffusion in 137 and early in 139? And then previously in our last lecture, we talked about pressure gradients. Well, partial pressure gradients work the same way. So if oxygen has a higher partial pressure on one side of the membrane and a lower partial pressure on the other side of the membrane, oxygen will move from the area of high partial pressure to the area of low partial pressure. Carbon dioxide does the same thing. Well, when we look at oxygen and we look at carbon dioxide, the partial pressure gradient for oxygen is a lot greater than it is for carbon dioxide. So it seems like more oxygen would move and not as much carbon dioxide would move. But that's not what happens. The same amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide move in both directions across a membrane. That's because carbon dioxide is more soluble in water and other liquids. Remember at the uh, capillaries, when we have capillary fluid exchange, it is fluid that's moving in and out of the capillaries. And there is gas and nutrients dissolved in that fluid. So even though oxygen has a steeper partial pressure gradient, carbon dioxide is more soluble. So we can pack a lot more carbon dioxide into fluid than we can oxygen. So since oxygen has a steeper partial pressure gradient, and carbon dioxide is more soluble, equal amounts of oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. Again, if that's confusing, don't worry about it. We will see this in action in just a little bit, and it should make a lot more sense then. Now, the thickness of the respiratory membrane is important. Remember when we were looking at the alveoli, we said the walls of the alveoli are only a single layer thick. They are made of simple squamous epithelium for the most part. And when we looked at capillaries, we saw that the wall of a capillary is only a single layer thick. It is also simple squamous epithelium. So if we looked at the space between the air inside our alveoli and the blood inside our pulmonary capillaries, there are only two very thin layers of cells one layer of the alveoli, one layer of the capillary, so two layers of squamous epithelium. That two-layer area is called the respiratory membrane. So the respiratory membrane is very, very thin. Two layers of squamous epithelial thick. If it's thicker than that, so the thickness of the respiratory membrane is important. If it's thicker than that, well, now gas has to diffuse across a thicker area, makes it more difficult. So we want the respiratory membrane to be very, very thin. Remember the function of simple squamous epithelium? 
to make diffusion efficient? Well, here we go. It does make diffusion efficient. But if we have more than those two layers, it's becoming less efficient. So over here uh, on this diagram, what we're seeing, the yellowish tan thing is an alveolus and the little net like area over it is a pulmonary capillary. So we are looking at an alveolus where gas exchange is taking place. When that happens, we're going to talk about something called ventilation perfusion coupling. Ventilation is, we learned that term back on the first uh, lecture of this chapter. Ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the alveoli. You can think of it as breathing. Ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the alveoli. Perfusion, well, perfusion is a word that means how much blood is moving through a capillary. We want ventilation and perfusion to match. If we have too little air moving in and out of the alveolus, then we're not maximizing the exchange of gas through the capillary. If we have too much air moving in and out of the alveolus, well, we're wasting a lot of air because not all of it is going to get into or out of the blood. Now, on the perfusion side, if we have too much blood coming through the capillary, then we're kind of being wasteful. We're not packing as much oxygen in as we can or removing as much carbon dioxide as we can. Or if we don't have enough blood coming into the capillary, well, that means we can't efficiently load oxygen into it and pull carbon dioxide out of it. So we want the amount of air moving in and out versus the amount of blood passing through. So really what happens is the level of oxygen can change the diameter of the arteriole to allow more or less blood into that capillary. And the amount of carbon dioxide can change the diameter of the bronchiole to let more or less air into that alveolus. So let's look to see exactly what happens there. If ventilation is less than perfusion, so if the air moving in and out doesn't meet the demand for the amount of blood that's coming through, what happens is we have decreased ventilation or increased perfusion that causes that. So we have high CO2 and low PO2. What happens is oxygen will change the diameter of the arterial. Pulmonary arterioles are going to constrict. Now we're letting less blood into the capillary. If we're letting less blood into that capillary, now we have the match of ventilation and perfusion. If it goes the other way, if ventilation is greater than perfusion, well, oxygen is going to cause the arterioles to dilate. So that's going to, again, allow more blood into the capillary so that we have the match of ventilation and perfusion. So let's take a look now at the... Okay, so what this really means is uh, we need to maximize the amount of blood related to the amount of gas moving in and out of the alveoli. Oxygen does that by changing the diameter of the arteriole as needed. Carbon dioxide does that by changing the diameter of the bronchiole as needed. We can see over here what happens when there is less ventilation than perfusion. Over here we can see what happens when there is more ventilation than perfusion. We adjust the diameter 
of the uh, capillary, or well, of the arteriole here. We adjust the diameter of the arteriole here. We also, we don't see it, but we also adjust the diameter of the bronchiole so that we can match the amount of blood perfusing into the capillary and the amount of air moving in and out of the alveolus. But why is that important? Let's take a look first at the partial pressures of oxygen, the partial pressures of carbon dioxide. Here, as long as you know your path of blood, it's going to get you through almost all of this. There's going to be some numbers. You do need to know the numbers for this section. First, we're going to look at oxygen. The way that we write the partial pressure of oxygen is PO2, a little p, and then O2 for the oxygen that we breathe, PO2. As long as you know your path of blood and where oxygen is high and where oxygen is low, that's going to tell you so much. Over here we can see the places in the body where oxygen is high, inside the lungs. The pulmonary veins that have already picked oxygen up and we're headed back to the heart. The systemic arteries, we're leaving the heart to go to the body to drop oxygen off. Same thing with low oxygen. The tissues, they use up oxygen. The pulmonary arteries, we're taking blood to the lungs to pick oxygen up. The systemic veins, we've already dropped oxygen off the tissues and we're headed back to the heart. Anywhere where oxygen is high, the PO2 is going to be 100 to 105. And as a matter of fact, we can just say 100. Don't worry about the range. We will just say where oxygen is high, it's 100 mmHg. Where oxygen is low, it's 40 mmHg. Know your path of blood. Know those two numbers, 100 and 40. Then you know your partial pressure of oxygen anywhere in the body. Same thing for CO2. Anywhere where CO2 is high, it's going to have a partial pressure of 45. Anywhere where CO2 is low, it's going to have a partial pressure of 40. Well, look here at oxygen. Oxygen 100, 40, carbon dioxide, 45, 40. So there's only three numbers that you need to know, 100, 45, and 40. It's 40 for both of them where it's low. The other thing is look at the lists here. They're exactly the opposite. Anywhere where oxygen is high, carbon dioxide is low. Anywhere where oxygen is low, Carbon dioxide is high. So you only need to know these six locations and those three numbers. If you know those three numbers, those six locations and path of blood, you've got it. Why do we need to know that? Because that's going to drive the movement of gases across membranes. Let's first look at what happens at the lungs. Over here on the left, we've got blood arriving at the pulmonary capillary. On the right, we've got the air inside the alveoli. What's the partial pressure of oxygen at the blood arriving at the capillary? Is it going to be high or low? Well, it hasn't picked any oxygen up yet, so it's going to be low, 40 mmHg. And if it's low oxygen, that means it's going to be what? High carbon dioxide. What's the number for high carbon dioxide? 45 mmHg. What about inside the alveoli? We've breathed in. We've taken a breath. It's going to be high in oxygen. So it's going to be 100 mmHg. And now there's not going to be much CO2, so it's only 40 mmHg. What do we see here? We see differences in numbers. We see gradients, partial pressure gradients. If we look at the oxygen partial pressure gradient, what's it tell us? 
oxygen is going to move or diffuse down its partial pressure gradient. We are loading oxygen into the blood from the lungs. In carbon dioxide, we are taking carbon dioxide waste out of the blood, putting it into the lungs so that we can breathe it out. But look at the numbers, something we were talking about just a little bit ago a few slides back. There's a big difference between 100 and 40 so oxygen is moving down its partial pressure gradient from 100 to 40. CO2, not so much, 45 to 40. There's not a very big partial pressure gradient. But remember, CO2 is very soluble. So CO2, even though there's not as big of a partial pressure gradient as that we have that fluid exchange, well, that fluid is going to have a lot of CO2 packed into it. So the same amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse across that membrane in opposite directions because oxygen has a high partial pressure gradient and CO2 has a high solubility. Blood leaving the lungs then after we have that exchange, oxygen is gonna be 100 and CO2 is gonna be 40. We're gonna deliver it now to the tissues. Oxygen in the blood arriving at the tissues is 100 mmHg. It's carrying a lot of oxygen. The CO2 in the blood, we've already dropped the waste CO2 off, so it's only going to be 40. But the tissues, well, tissues consume oxygen, so there's not a lot of oxygen there available. It's only going to be 40 mmHg. But what did we say was a waste product of cellular respiration? CO2. CO2 builds up in the tissues to 45 mmHg. What's going to happen? Same thing that we saw happen at the lungs. Oxygen moves down its partial pressure gradient. CO2 moves down its partial pressure gradient. So blood leaving the tissues after picking up waste carbon dioxide and dropping off oxygen, it's going to be 40 mmHg PO2, 45 mmHg PCO2. And here is a diagram showing what we just drew out. Up here's the alveoli, blood arriving at the alveoli, blood exiting the alveoli. Down here's the tissues, same thing. So here is the uh, components of the tissue interstitium. Here is blood everywhere where oxygen is low and CO2 is high. Here is the air inside the alveoli. Here is blood leaving the alveoli. And here is blood inside those uh, areas where uh, the oxygen is high and CO2 is low. All right, so that's the end of this lecture. Our next lecture is going to look at how our blood transports those gases around our body. All right, take care. There's a lot going on there, so make sure to ask questions as you have them. All right, talk to you next time.